I hope you enjoyed last week's episode on healthy friendships and that it helped you identify or confirm the true blues in your life. If you missed it, please go back and listen to episode 45. Today is Valentine's Day, so happy Valentine's Day to you and yours. I am joined by my Valentine of 26 years, my husband, who is going to help me talk today about the viability of marriage. My husband's name is George, for those of you who don't know, and his middle name, believe it or not, is Love. I'm not joking about that. That's his real middle name. And I have to say, he has lived up to that name by loving me and our three children, Well, George is usually working behind the scenes producing the podcast, but today he is helping me on the other side of the microphone. Welcome to the program, George. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, honey. You're doing great. Happy Valentine's Day, or should I say Happy Love Day? Thank you very much. Happy Love Day to you too as well. (laughs) Okay, so I invited you on the podcast today to answer the question from our perspective and experience, does marriage work? Is it doable? Can it run the distance? And is it worth the investment? But before we, you know, get into that, I want to share with you and our listeners, you know, some stats on marriage, in, at least in the United States. And it has been predicted that nearly 50% of all marriages in the U.S. will end in divorce or separation, and that 41% of all first marriages end and divorce. Those are high numbers, right? I would agree. Yeah. And it begs the question, you know, why do people divorce? And apparently marital infidelity is a leading cause of divorce. According to a study from the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy, as many as 25% of married men and 15% of married women have had extramarital affairs. And between 70 and 80% of divorces are initiated by women. What's interesting to me is the length of a marriage in the U.S. is seven to eight years. And the toughest age for children to deal with the separation or divorce of their parents is six to 12 years of age. That's a lot of data, but it does give you a good picture of the status of marriage in America. And I have to say, those stats would really lead you to believe that the institution of marriage doesn't work and that it's by and large a failure, at least here in the U.S. What do you think about those stats, George, particularly the 50 percent divorce rate? Well, look at the historical numbers. I would probably estimate that those numbers have been going up since about the 50s. Okay. As a society, we have walked away from the architect of marriage. God. And when you say we, just... To clarify, we're talking about the culture at large, in general, our society, America. So if you don't follow the blueprint, you're not going to have the intended results. So now it's not working. Well, of course it's not working because we're not following the blueprint. You don't follow the blueprint, you won't get the desired outcome. Exactly. I also think it's interesting that infidelity is the number one cause of divorce, at least here in the U.S. I mean, I I understand how it leads to divorce, but I I wonder about the reasons, you know, it occurs so pervasively in the first place. Why do you think people cheat on their spouses? I believe that the reason why people are cheating is because they got into marriage for the wrong reasons. They have this glorified idea of what marriage actually is. So if you expect marriage to be this perfect situation where there's never going to be any strife and all your needs are going to be met and you don't have to do anything for it, you don't have to lift a finger to do anything for him and vice versa. And I think that's the problem. We walked away from all of the basic principles of tenets and then we have these unreal expectations of the other person. Interesting, interesting point. You know, yeah, I'm sure there are many reasons. It's not to say that, you know, you can't change your decision if there's abuse or if the other person won't commit to you or cheats on you. You know, the Bible even gives you a way out for infidelity. So we we do understand sometimes you can't work it out. But it is, saddens me that infidelity is the number one cause of divorce, at least here in the U.S. What, what do you think, George, are some practical things? You know, can, can we make our marriage a fair proof? And if we can, what, what do you think might be some practical things we can do or consider, you know, to possibly make our marriage a fair proof, since that's the big issue in America? If you look at a beautiful person, mm-hmm. you look and then you don't take that second look. If you take that second look, that's when it becomes lustful. Okay. So, so don't linger. First... Don't linger. Right. When you're looking. First look is fine, but the second look is when it becomes a little questionable. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
Yeah, because so, I, we're all human and, and we're going exactly. to find other people, people other than our spouse attractive. But I do think what you said is true. It's what you do with the attraction that matters. The Bible says stay away from the very appearance of evil. So, you know, don't put yourself in compromising situations and think you won't be led down a path that, that you know, won't get you in trouble. If you find yourself even, for example, talking more to a person who's not your spouse about your feelings and your problems than your spouse, or you're telling that person secrets, you're, you know, keeping from your spouse, you need to check that because that is how emotional affairs begin. So we have to, you know, take responsibility and modify and, you know, monitor our own behavior. Right. And the other side of that is, if you find that um, while you're at work, your coworker is bringing you breakfast bagels every morning and, and all that kind of stuff every day, but not giving them to everybody else, just to you, that might mm, be a, a sign yeah. of there might be a problem. You know what I mean? Yeah, good point. Don't yeah. entertain someone's advances or flirting if you're married. All uh, the time, you know, yeah. Right. A wise woman once told me to act like you're married if you're married. You know, people shouldn't mm. be shocked to find out you're married. You know, you don't want to give vibes of the impression that you're available in your speech, in your dress, or in your mannerisms. You know, don't do things like take your ring off or turn it around or place it on the wrong finger when you're out in certain places. And like we were saying before, don't entertain people's advances. If they're flirting and you're married, that's inappropriate. And you should behave like it's inappropriate. You know, the bottom line is you shouldn't act like you're single if you're married. And you shouldn't act like, you know, you're married if you're single. It's really that simple. Stay in your lane. Make a decision. Don't be double-minded because the scriptures or a person, as the scripture says, who has divided loyalty because that person, according to scripture, is unstable in all of his or her ways and should not expect to receive anything from God. So, you know, having your cake and eating it too is for birthday parties, not marriage. <laughs> I'll just say that. That's a good one. I like that. That's like, okay. that's good. I like it. And I know this kind of stuff isn't popular, but I'm not here for popularity. I'm here to help marriages. That's our, our intention and that's our aim and that's what we're here to do. And, and after 26 years of marriage, I think you and I can say that that's, that's truthful. You have to stay away from the appearance of evil. You know, you have to act like you're married. Um, you know, stay in your lane. Don't be double-minded. Be committed. Make, make a decision that marriage is what you want and marriage is what you're going to act like want to kind of walk through, walk people through before you get married. So let's talk about the dating process just a little bit. Some things that maybe people ought to know, you know, when they're dating, who may eventually want to marry one day. What are some things that people who are on that side of the coin should consider? When I was dating, I followed the law of diminishing returns. So if I spend too much time on something and I'm not getting enough profit, um, either out of uh, time or value, uh, I need to switch. I can't stay in a relationship or in a situation where it's taking more time out of me and I'm not getting a result. So while I was dating, I have generated in my mind for that ideal mate. And um, as I was dating, I would cross things off the list and add things to the list and uh, make a decision based on if, if I wanted to continue with this person. And okay. so I can't, I can't imagine being with somebody longer than six months if it's not going to work out at all. There's no reason to do it. Six months. This, wow. Yeah. That's, let's say you're 20 years old and you spend two years with somebody. You spent 10 percent of your life with somebody. And if you decide that you're not going to be with them, you walk away and that's, you know, 20 percent of your life gone. Yeah. It's yeah. I, I, I would add that, you know, you should know what you want in a potential mate, even in the dating process. Absolutely. You don't want to be unrealistic because nobody's That's perfect. your vetting process. I agree. That's the vetting I agree. process. I agree. So go in to dating knowing what you're looking for, knowing what you want in a potential mate. Don't be unrealistic because nobody's perfect, but you need to know what the deal breakers are for you, things like your core values, and make sure they at least line up with that. You know, you need to really, in my opinion, date strategically with a focus. Don't haphazardly or randomly date. You don't randomly pursue a career. You figure out what you want to do. You go to the right school. You go get training to do what it is you want to do. You need to approach dating, in my opinion, the same way. I would agree. I mean, like, if you're looking for a husband, you don't go to the nearest crack house looking for your next husband. All righty then. Okay. And, and as, far as, what you were, <laughs> as far as what you were saying, moving on with the cutoff time, like that six month mark, I think you said you should really kind of determine where this is going or not going. You know, whatever that time frame is for you, I, I think it's important because I, I want to kind of speak about women for a minute in that cutoff time, I'm going to call it, because women get their hearts involved. 
And, and once they do, it's hard to leave or it's hard to think clearly with your head. So it really is best to have a cutoff time or to leave before, you know, your heart gets involved in, in this situation, especially if you're with a person who's not right for you or is not a good match for marriage. I also want to add that, you know, I think people should live their lives while they're single. They need to enjoy that stage. Don't spend your entire singlehood yeah. looking for a mate, looking for that a spouse or trying yep. to get married because you'll miss some of the advantages and the joys of being single. Pursue your goals, travel, enjoy that freedom, live your life. You know, there's a scripture that says when the time is right, I, the Lord, will make it happen. You know, when I met my husband, I was working and I was living in another state. I was doing my thing. I was paying my own bills, as that song says. I was pursuing my career. You know, our relationship was long distance for a while before we both ended up in the same city. But when the time was right, our relationship transitioned to marriage. We did not force anything. We just let not everything happen. Exactly. We just let everything happen naturally while we both were living our lives. And I think that's important to say. And believe it or not, we were friends and we were even dating other people. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, we were even dating other people. We weren't even exclusive for quite a bit of, of that time as right. well. We didn't meet and stop our lives for each other. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, I think that's important. Live your life. And, and to the ladies, I would say, you know, the Bible says he who finds a wife finds a, a good thing. That doesn't mean sit on your couch and, and wait for your, your doorbell to ring. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, we're not talking about that. But let him yeah. find you living your life, not waiting on a prince like in Cinderella to save you. That is only a movie. You're, you're not a damsel in distress. You're a whole person made by God with a purpose to fulfill on earth. Go about living your life. I despise that saying, you complete me. I think that two whole people make a whole relationship together. Yeah. I think but, that's good. Yeah. And, but and that 50% crap. Oh my goodness. Drives yeah. me up a wall. Yeah. Well, you leave so much work undone <laughs> when you're going to a marriage with only 50% of yourself worked on, you need to work on yourself. That's why I'm saying in the, in the single stage, while, you know, while you're dating and you're vetting, as you said, you need to be working on yourself. You need to be living your life. You need to be finding out what God put you on earth to do and, and heading in that direction. So when you meet that person that you do want to join your life with, you know, you're, you're coming in as a whole person going into the marriage, you know, when you do meet that right person. The thing I would add is observe the person in different seasons and settings of life while you're dating them. You know, maybe you've mm. never seen that person upset and don't know how they handle, you know, disagreements or arguments. I would say don't wait until you're married to find that out. You know, Good maybe you only you only saw them on the mountaintop, you know, when things were going well or that is all they showed you, maybe. But how do they handle the valleys of life? Because they're coming, for sure. Go ahead. That's what I meant by six months. Okay. Because that's more than enough time to see everybody in every aspect of their life every season of it because you'll see their ups you'll see their downs and if you're just seeing them on saturday you're just seeing them you know when they, when they're planning and you're, you're made up and you know if you're just seeing them on that one day that's not enough yeah yeah you get a, you get a more complete picture i agree get the big picture like you were saying in terms of who that person is so you can know what you might be getting into and who that person really is not just who they're pretending to be or you know, showing the, the best of themselves to you. I, I remember when we went on our, I went to your grandmother's house and. Yes, they had a rule that you had to spend time with the family and then, go, and then go home and then come back. If you get an open door to come back to date me and take me somewhere alone. Yeah, a multitude of counselors, their safety. You absolutely, know? absolutely. Yep. We, we talked about the dating process, things you need to look for, you know, when you're dating. And, and now let's say they have moved on to the to the point where they feel they've met the right person and they want to get engaged. You know, I, I want to talk a little bit about that because I do think that everyone should have some form of premarital counseling where you, you know, talk about how you feel about things like money. Do you want kids? How do you plan to raise those kids? And other important topics you don't want to find out about if you can help it of course after well, you're married well you see okay <laughs> we need to talk about that then that's the purpose of the dating those questions right. should come up during the dating process if you're just going out to the movies and not talking afterwards that's a whole problem yeah i agree i agree but but the beauty i think of premarital counseling is you have a third party sort of a another person can help you sort of sort through that and and figure that out but i do agree hopefully you found that out by that point but if you haven't you need to go to premarital counseling. You need to deal with your childhood trauma or issues because everybody brings some baggage with them into the, the marriage. So you should try to unpack 
as much of that baggage as you can so that you don't weigh your spouse down or overshadow your marriage with your luggage, if you will. Go to counseling if necessary, but that's part of that going in whole right? We want to check ourselves and deal with our stuff so we don't weigh down the marriage too much. I would say don't marry a project or potential. Yes, to a certain extent, we all have unrealized potential, but some of that should be realized before you get married. Do not marry a promise. I promise to change when we marry. I promise to do better when. I promise to start that business when. No, no, no. What are you doing now? What steps are you taking now to make that dream, that vision, or that plan happen? Because faith without works is dead, right, George? Yeah, I have a quote what you are to become, you are now becoming. Say One that these, again. What you are to become, you are now becoming. Okay. So if you say that you want to be a lawyer, mm-hmm. is there evidence right now that you are going to become a lawyer? If there's a crime to be a lawyer, is there's enough evidence to convict you of that? Yeah, that's good. That's good. And I would say words need to match actions. You know, a lot of these things we're talking about really can, you can put engagement and dating kind of together if you want, or you could just put it in dating, like you said. But words need to match actions. If they don't match, always go with what the actions are telling you, especially when it comes to marrying or considering marrying someone. Go with those actions. That's where the truth is. Wise counsel. You know, you talked about that, George. We live in a culture, in America at least, where wisdom is really not sought after much. And listening to elders has become a thing of the past. We don't think they have anything to offer us. And we think they don't know what they're talking about and they don't understand us. But the scripture says that without good direction, people lose their way. The more wise counsel you follow, the scripture says, the better your chances. So there you have it. You need to seek out wise people. You need to seek out elders for their thoughts on the person you want to marry and listen to what they have to say. I even contacted some of my friends that knew you, that went to your high school and checked on your checked on you. And I found yeah. out, you know, that she that that, you know, she was a good girl and, you know, she was nice and she was intelligent, smart, all that stuff. And that was the consensus when I when I asked my friends about you. And yeah. then yeah. When I after I met your grandmother, mm-hmm. she started talking to me about your pastor. And I said, I know your pastor. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that was great. You know? I think that's good. And that's part of that whole getting to know the big picture, the whole person, seeing them in different yeah. seasons, finding out their past. You know, you might meet people from their past, past, present. And, you know, you can get an idea what the future might be like. I got another one for you. Go ahead. So now when you're talking about let's talk about the good, the bad and the ugly. OK. One of my great questions was so let's talk about any of your, your past relationships. So what happened? What Where did it end? What happened? You're saying th- those questions should be should be asked. Uh, Yes. To the person right you're you're considering. Yes. Right, right. Exactly. What happened? Sure. And and, and if the person is contrite and, and says, you know, there's some wrong on all of our sides, that's a mature response. But if they're blaming the other person for everything and you have no culpability, this, that, and the other. That's a good it's point. Pro- it's that's probably a, that's a red flag. That's Seriously. A good point. It may be cliche to say, but I believe marriage works if you work it. It's like a muscle. Absolutely. Right? Yep. It'll go into atrophy state, I think. If you, if you don't use it, you have to work at your marriage just like you work at your career or anything else in your life you want to have success in. But it does take two committed people. Right, George? Yes. You have to, you have to take time out. You have to plan time if necessary. You need to, do, you need to make sure that you make it a priority. I agree. And you and I really made a decision that, you know, divorce wasn't an option. So, you know, every argument that we have, we don't have many, but they don't feel like they're going to end in divorce because our foundational premise is divorce is not an option. You know, we may have we may have to go somewhere and cool off or figure out a compromise, pray for an answer to the problems. But we're not arguing. No, we're arguing, I should say, from the point of view that this is not going to end in divorce. And I think that 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 makes a big difference. And keeping the marriage intact. Well, but in, in addition to that, it's a there's a mutual respect and admiration. Even when we argue with each other, mm-hmm. I have to say, I still love and respect you, even if we're arguing. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned, too, George, earlier about outside interference. I do think you need to keep your marriage between the two married people. The Bible even says when marriage happens, a man is leaving his mother and father and, and uniting with his wife. So... You know, keep people out of your marriage. Be very careful who you open up to, and especially when problems occur and who you receive advice from. Outside interference is a real problem because think about, you know, I don't know 
any other way to describe it, but you know, like when you're listening to the radio and your radio might receive outside interference, you can't hear what you're listening to anymore, right? So if you allow outside voices in, the same thing can happen. You won't be able to hear your spouse this voice anymore. So you want to be real careful about outside interference in your marriage. And let's talk about the quality of that interference. Okay. <laughs> let's say the person that's giving you advice has a, a bad track record with their relationships. Mm -hmm. Do you listen to that advice? I don't think that's wisdom. I would say that that would be the, that would be the advice of what not to do more than what to do. Correct. But if yeah, they're telling so you what to do, they're not the person to listen to. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, marriage is a daily decision to, to choose to stay committed to your vows, to your partner, and to your marriage. It really is not what we think it is that one time I do make a decision to get married one time, but you make a decision to stay married and stay committed to those vows that you made that one time every single day, if that makes any sense. Yeah, through the good and the bad, through the mm -hmm. trauma, through tragedy through pain, through heartache, through suffering, through joy, yeah. through all people, of it. Yeah. People have taken away a lot of those vows. They don't want to say the vows that, that you yeah. and I said, you know, what is it? Through sick, sickness and a health, richer or for poorer, better or for worse, right? A lot of people don't want to recite that anymore because people don't seem to want to sign up for that. But that is what... <laughs> the marriage partnership is. Um, and that's the problem. See, now you're getting to the point of it. The right. problem is they're walking away from the tennis that were already set. Well, people want, I believe, I think a lot of people want what's easy. And if it sounds like it's not easy, I'm not really signing up for that. Or if it doesn't work for me. And if it right. sounds like it's not working for me, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm, I'm signing on the dotted line. Yeah, it got to be good for me and only me. Yeah. So you have to be willing to uh, grow with the other person and give, give them space to grow. You know, you and I are not the same people we were when we first started out. Some of our interests have changed. Our looks have changed as, we, as we've gotten older and, and, and so on. But you have to make adjustments along the way to accommodate each other. You may have to check in every once in a while. OK, what do you need now? I know what you needed then, but had those needs changed and how can I how can I accommodate that? And so you have to allow that room for growth and and your partner has to, to do the same for you don't you do you agree with that absolutely and okay. it's all about the question is and it should all it all goes back to when you were dating what do you bring into the table mm -hmm. and make sure that it, you're not going you're not the person's bringing good looks and beauty to the table that's it that's fine but make sure that those things that you're making you're judging your lifelong relationship is more than something that's um, well, that change that might or may or may not change. Exactly, I was going to say looks can change, and they will, as you get older. In, in some way, some form, some shape, they'll change. Marriage is not all about you. You can't be selfish, you know. In marriage, selfish and marriage don't go together. You have to support and serve your spouse. If both people are serving e each other, then everybody's needs will be met. Everybody's needs are met, yep. right? But if I'm just thinking about me and never thinking about you, that's not going to work. That's a whole problem. Yeah, whole entire problem. I just want to say in conclusion to those listening that you are one decision away from the life you want, whether marriage is in the cards for you or not. You know, you need to decide what you want. Commit to that decision and do the work every single day. Marriage requires, you know, everyday maintenance and everyday commitment, just like anything else. But the good news is my husband and I are here to tell you that 26 years and three kids later, marriage is worth the investment. Right, George? Absolutely. Yes, Okay, it is. so our answer to the question is yes, it is worth the investment. And here's the thing. You don't have to suffer through it for it to work. The principles we talked about today will work if you follow them. Anything authored by God, God will sustain. So the Bible says, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will succeed. So whatever we give, whatever we surrender to God, he'll take care of, just like he takes care of you every day. You know, he, he'll take care of your marriage if you allow him to. And with God's help, your daily decision and your daily commitment to do the work, you can have a happy life and a happy marriage. No, marriage is not easy, but with the right person, it's definitely worth it. This was fun, George, having you on the other side of the microphone. Thank you for doing this episode with me. Not a problem, baby. And thank you to the listeners as well for joining us. Bye for now.